In His Grip with Dr. Chuck Betters of Mark Inc. Ministries. Today we continue with the message from our archives titled, When Will Christ Come? Part 4, from the series Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. Each In His Grip message is designed to help turn your heart towards Jesus and to equip you to walk by faith. Let's join Dr. Betters in the sanctuary. That we begin chapter 20, verse 1, with the beginning of the New Testament era. Chapter 20, verse 1 begins by saying, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss, and holding in his hand a great chain. That is a picture of Jesus Christ and the incarnation of Christ when 2,000 years ago he became a man for a purpose. Now, friends, before we go any further, I think it's important also to note that the millennial reign that's shown to us in chapter 20, beginning with verse 4, occurs before the final judgment. You say, where's the final judgment? Well, look at chapter 20. Now, we're skipping ahead to verse 11. Now, when you come to chapter 20, verse 11, you can read chapter 20 as a progression of events. You can read it in chronological order because it's the beginning of a new section. You read verses 11 and following. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky, fled from his presence. There was no place for them. This is a picture of judgment. This is a picture of the final doom. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he, was, what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, friends, what am I saying to you? I'm saying that the millennium that he speaks of in the first six verses occurs before the final judgment that he refers to in verses 11 through 15. The judgment follows the millennium. Well, that shouldn't be anything strange to anyone. If you go back to Matthew, hold your place there in, in Revelation. Go back to Matthew and look at chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse... Uh, uh, 27, Matthew 16, 27. Jesus, after he had talked about he who would come after me must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will find it. Then you come down to verse 27 of Matthew 16. He says, for the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then what's going to happen? He will reward each person according to what he has done. That sounds like Revelation 20, verse 11, doesn't it? He will reward according to what we have done. Two sets of books will be opened. All men, both saved and lost, at the coming of Christ will appear before him. Those who are saved, their names will be written in the book of life. Those who are lost, their name will be simply written in what is called the books. And we will give an account with what we have done with Jesus Christ. If we've come to know him, we're granted eternal life. If we have not come to know him, we're cast into the lake of fire. Now that's a very clear passage. It's a very clear indication that when Christ comes again, he will bring the judgment, not the millennium. When he comes again, he will not establish a millennium. He will come to judge the quick and the dead. That's nothing new to New Testament. In fact, if you go over to 2 Thessalonians, you'll see it graphically portrayed. 2 Thessalonians. Uh, look with me at uh, chapter 1, beginning with verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And... Uh, Verse 7, verse 5 will start. And this is evidence that God's judgment is right. 2 Thessalonians 1, 5, you with me? This is evidence that God's judgment is right. And as a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God 
for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when? This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. Notice what the Bible is saying. When Christ comes back, what will happen? Judgment, not a millennium. Judgment. So when we go back to Revelation chapter 20, we have in verse 11 through 15 the judgment. But we have in verses 1 through 6 the millennium. So the millennium comes before the judgment. But the judgment occurs at the coming of Jesus Christ. So the obvious question is this, has Jesus Christ already returned? And the answer, of course, is no. We still look forward to the day when Christ returns. Therefore, we must be in the millennium. We must be in the millennium now because the next event we're looking for is the coming of Christ, which will usher in judgment. So go back to Revelation chapter 20. And you'll see that it refers to the binding of Satan. What does this mean? You look at verse uh, uh, 10, for example. It says in verse 10, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever. And verse 14, uh, it says, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And verse 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now friends, the lake of fire is the place of final punishment. It is hell. It is the place of Satan's final doom. But when you look at chapter 20, uh, and you read verse 1, it says, And I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. Uh, the NIV has captured the difference between the lake of fire that is referred to in verses 10, 11, 14, and 15, and the abyss which is referred to in, in verse 1. The binding of Satan is a binding that takes place when the angel who comes down from heaven carries with him a certain chain and binds him when he comes. What is this binding? If you look at verse 3, it says in verse 3, he threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years were ended. You say, what's this all about? Friends, the key phrase there is deceiving the nations. The binding of Satan into the abyss is apocalyptic language and it's the way figuratively of saying that Satan's binding and the binding of Satan by this angel, whoever this angel was, is a figurative way of expressing that he no longer has the capability of deceiving the nations. You say, what's that mean? Well, any Jew who would have read this would have known what it meant. The language is very clear to any Jew. You see, the whole Old Testament is a picture of one nation and one people to whom special revelation had been given. And that nation was the nation Israel. All of the other nations on the face of the earth, every other nation on the face of the earth, were considered to be deceived and living in foolishness. That they were ruled by Satan. The kingdom of Saint Satan ruled over those nations. But one nation... Only one nation had received special revelation, and that was the nation Israel. It was to them that God ruled. It was over them that God ruled. He was their king. But the rest of the nations, the Gentile world, was deceived by Satan. They, they considered this a foolish message, a deceiving message. That's why in Acts chapter 17, verse 30, you don't have to read it, the Old Testament nations are referred to as being in ignorance 
Why? Because special revelation was given only to one people, only to one nation. And so in a very real sense, the binding of Satan that is referred to in chapter 20, verse 1, is that when Christ came and died on the cross, he broke down the barrier between Jew and Gentile, and no longer was revelation given only to one nation, but Satan, who had been controlling all the kingdoms of the earth, all the power that he had over the kingdoms of the earth was broken when Christ died on the cross so that now he can no longer deceive the nations and the preaching of the gospel can go on and men and women, whether they be Jew or Gentile, can come to understand the gospel. That's the abyss he's referring to. That's the locking up of Satan. It's not his final state. It's not hell. He is not cast into hell at this point. He will be cast into hell when Christ comes. He is free to roam, but his power has been limited. He has, in every sense of the word, been bound so that he cannot oppose the church and stop us from preaching the gospel. That's why Jesus said, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Even Satan cannot stand against the preaching of the gospel. And that preaching will continue until Christ comes again. Satan no longer has blinded the nations because the preaching of the gospel has reached beyond the Jew and has extended to the Gentile. That's why when you read in verse 3, it speaks of him being bound so that he cannot deceive the nations. The nations is a reference to the Gentile world. The gospel of Christ, the kingdom of Christ has come and the partition was broken down. No longer is there one people, but there are many peoples. And in that sense, Satan has been bound. That's why when Jesus gave us the great commission in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, he tells us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age, notice the reference. Notice the reference, even until the end of the age, Satan cannot control the preaching of the gospel. God has given to us that great commission, and nothing that he can do can stop the spread of the kingdom of God. That is the binding of Satan. That is what it means. Of course, the premillennialists again have to answer the question, if Satan is bound as they say he's bound during this thousand-year reign, then why does sin and death continue in the millennial kingdom? The answer is obvious. There is no millennial kingdom. We are in the millennial kingdom. Well, let's see if we can prove it a little further. If you go back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, and look with me at verse 29. I want you to note something here. Matthew 12, 29. This was the, the issue of Jesus and Satan. Jesus and Beelzebub, they brought him, verse 22, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute. Jesus healed him so that he could see and talk. All the people were astonished and said, could this be the son of David? The Pharisees heard it, verse 24. They said, it's only by the devil, the prince of demons, that this fellow drives out demons. Then when you get on to verse 29, Jesus makes this interesting statement. He says again, how can anyone enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Unless he first ties up the strong man. This is a referencing to the binding of Satan that Jesus would do when he ties up the strong man. By the way, the word used there for ties up is the same identical word that is used in Revelation chapter 20 for the binding of Satan. It's the same language. It's the same word. What's he trying to tell us? That Christ, when he came and died on the cross, bound Satan and gave to the church all authority and all power to preach the gospel to every nation. And Satan is absolutely powerless to stop the spread of the kingdom of God. Oh, will he throw roadblocks? Yes. Will he tempt us? Yes. 
But can he stop the kingdom of God and the preaching of the gospel? Absolutely not. For centuries he has tried tribulation and martyrdom and Nero's and Valerian's and Domitian's and all others, and yet the, the, the continued cry from church history is what? The blood of the martyrs, as one said, becomes what? The seed of the church. He cannot bind us because he himself is bound. Or go over to Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. And look with me at verse 17. This is a picture after the 70. Jesus had commissioned 70 of his disciples to go out on their own. They went out on their own, and even the demons were subjected to them. Even the demons were in submission. They come back from their mission in Luke chapter 10. And verse 17, what do we read? Luke 10, 17, the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, Jesus replied to what they said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. When did Satan fall? When Jesus died on the cross. Satan fell like lightning and he gave to us, the church, the power to preach the gospel, to trample on him, to storm the gates of hell, to gain the victory. And no matter how much you try to look at it another way, friends, as I read the book, when it's all said and done, we win. We win. Same language. John chapter 12, one final passage that uses that same language. John chapter 12, beginning with verse 31. What do we read here? John 12, 31. Jesus said the voice, verse 30, was for your benefit. John 12, 30. Not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be, underscore these words, driven out. You know what that word is? Same root word as used in Revelation 20 to speak of the binding of Satan. Same identical word. Now is Satan bound. But I tell you, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. When is the binding of Satan? When Christ is lifted up. All power is given to us through Jesus Christ, because Satan is bound. Now go back to Revelation chapter 20. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss. That's not the lake of fire. That's the victory over Satan. That's the curtailing of his power in his hand with a great chain. He sees the dragon. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent. Just in case you're not sure who this is, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now again, friends, you have to understand, apocalyptic language has a numbering system. The number 10 is the number of uh, a long period of time. It does not mean literally 1,000 years or 365 days per year. The word thousand is a multiple of ten. And in apocalyptic numerology, it simply means a long, determinate, indeterminate length of time. A long period of time is what the thousand years is referring to. A very long time of indeterminate length, a complete period. And what is that thousand years? That's the period between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. And where is the kingdom? He's reigning in heaven. You say, how do you know that? Well, if you look at verse 4, it tells you, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. Now John is shifting to heaven. Verses 1 through 3, the scenes on earth. That's the kingdom of God on earth. But when you go to verse 4, he's now looking at thrones. He's now seated in heaven. And who does he see there? He sees the dead in Christ. He sees those who have been martyred. He's now seeing where they are. Where are they? They're on thrones. And what are they doing? They're ruling. They're making judgments. They're reigning with Christ who has come into his kingdom. When is this happening? Right now. 
Right now, if God were to transport you up into heaven, you know what you would see? You would see the dead in Christ who have been resurrected, who have come to life. That's what he tells us in verse 4, I saw thrones. The, she, the scene is shifted. The scene of verses 1 through 3 is taking place on earth, and the scene of verses 4 through 6 is taking place in heaven, but it's taking place simultaneously. To those who are on the thrones, given the right to judge in some unknown sense. And who are they? They're the ones who are said in verse 4, who came to life. You say, what's that mean? What does that mean? The people who come to life are the ones who experience the first resurrection. If you who are believers were to drop dead today, if you were to walk out of here and drop dead today, the Spirit of God would move down into your spirit and pull that soul spirit out of your body and you in every sense of the word would come to life. You would be brought into the presence of God. That's the first resurrection. The second resurrection that he makes reference to is when Christ comes again. You see, when he comes again, what's going to happen is out of the grave, your body's going to come. Your soul spirit, if you die before that coming, will come with Christ and those two will meet in the air and he will glorify you and give you a new body because he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. That's what he's talking about in these verses. That's what he's referencing in these verses. You'll notice verse 5. He says in verse 5, and the rest of the dead... Verse 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. Who are the rest of the dead? Those are the people who die as unbelievers. And they don't come to life during this entire period. They are not brought to heaven. When you die and you're lost, you don't go to heaven. When you die and you're lost, you die and you die in your sins and you go to hell. So during this thousand year, this long period of time between the first coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ, there's two kinds of people. Those who come to life and those who don't come to life. Those who go to heaven and those who go to hell. Those who reign with Christ and those who are condemned forever. And where's Satan during this whole time? He's roaming the earth like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But does he have power over the church? Absolutely not. The power of Satan has been broken. The power of sin has been broken. He cannot rob us of our salvation. He cannot take away from us what Christ has given. He cannot unsave us because Christ has saved us. And he cannot stop the spread of the kingdom. And in that sense, he is bound. He is bound. And they come to life. And they reign with Christ. Well, the rule of Christ is not an earthly one. It's a heavenly one. And you'll notice in verse 5, until the thousand years were ended. You see, what's going to happen to the rest of the dead? Those who die in their sins. Well, verse 6 tells us, it says, Blessed and holy are those who have part in the first resurrection. Which one is that now? Do you remember that one? The first resurrection is when you die. And God takes your soul spirit to be with him. Blessed are you who have part in the first resurrection. Why? Because as verse 6 tells us, over you, blessed are you who have part in the first resurrection, for the second death has no power over you. What's the second death? That's the eternal judgment. When an unbeliever dies, that's their first death. Their second death is when they stand before God and he casts them into hell. Blessed are you who have part in the first resurrection, for on you the second death has no power. What is given to you instead? You will be priest of God, and you will be priest of Christ, and you will reign with him for how long? A thousand years! That's that entire period between the first coming and the second coming. And then when he comes to earth, he will establish his new heaven and his new earth where we will reign with him throughout all eternity. What happens to those who die the second death? Verse 14 tells us they're cast into the lake of fire. The first resurrection is the death of all believers. The 
the second resurrection which is implied is the resurrection of our bodies that is coming. The second death is the judgment of the wicked. We are the saints who reign with him. So where is the kingdom? The kingdom is now. Every one of you who know Jesus Christ are in the kingdom. Christ reigns and rules over his kingdom in heaven because his kingdom is not of this world. That's why we are referred to as citizens passing through, ambassadors passing through. Our home is not this world. That's why, friends, I believe that the only possible explanation for the end times is the amillennial view or the realized millennium. That is, we are in the kingdom right now and our Christ rules and our Christ reigns. Thank you for listening to In His Grip, a ministry of Mark Inc. We just concluded the message titled, When Will Christ Come? Part 4 from the series Unveiling and Understanding Revelation. You can download this sermon at www.markinc.org. At markinc.org, you'll find numerous free resources that offer help and hope to the hurting. You can also safely give online to help keep In His Grip on the air. Thank you in advance for your support.